Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Lind. I'm the uh, policy director of the Economic Growth Program at the New America Foundation, and it's uh, our great pleasure uh, to co-sponsor uh, uh, this event in the OECD Breakfast Series. Uh, so all of you who have not gotten your breakfast, uh, please get it quickly. Uh, uh, we're pleased to welcome as our guest Dr. Adrian Blundell Wignall. He is the Deputy Director in the Directorate for Financial and Enterprise Affairs at the OECD, uh, where he's been since uh, February 2007. Uh, he's an Australian citizen with a first-class honors degree and PhD in economics from Cambridge University. Uh, he's been the author of extensive publications on financial markets and monetary policy, as well as uh, uh, analyst of uh, uh, analytical studies and reports. He's held uh, economist positions in the OECD Economics Department, the Reserve Bank of Australia, and the Economic Planning Advisory Council of Australia, has worked as head of the research department at the Reserve Bank of Australia, uh, and other positions include head of equity strategy research at Citigroup, Australia Limited, executive vice president, and head of asset allocation at BT Funds Management, and head of derivative overlays and uh, levered products at Bankers Trust. He's also the author of a, a forthcoming, or is it already out, uh, uh, Origins of the Financial Crisis and Requirements for Reform in the Journal of uh, Asian Economics, which I recommend to you as an excellent overview of the global uh, financial crisis, as well as uh, this monograph uh, co-authored with the others at the OECD, The Financial Crisis, Reform and Exit Strategies. Uh, please join me in uh, welcoming Dr. Adrian Blundell Wignall. Uh, well, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be here uh, today. I was uh, in uh, um, St. Louis yesterday, which I'd never been to before, to give a speech to the uh, uh, National Association of Business Economists. Uh, I had the pleasure of seeing uh, uh, Lawrence Summers uh, give a, uh, an address in accepting his Adam Smith Award. So, uh, uh, but he did say one thing in that uh, speech, which, is, uh, which I really noted, uh, where he was asked a question about financial reform, the topic I'm talking about. And in, that, uh, in his response to that, he said that, um, that he wanted to go through the principles that he thought, and he, six main principles he thought would be uh, the very general principles they were for, for reforming the financial system. And, um, and I was sitting there thinking as he said it that um, it's very interesting, isn't it, that here we sit um, since 2007, middle of the year, and here's one of the top policy advisors in this country um, basically saying that when we, we reform the financial system that we should use these six principles, which tells you that uh, something which I'm talking about today, uh, that policymakers have not, have not decided on what the future shape of the financial system will be. Here we sit today hoping that banks are going to start lending, raising capital and doing things, and we have not even decided on what the future shape of the financial system will be. So that is a very nice uh, way to introduce my talk. But before I get into it, um, I should just say that uh, my views, and because they're always quite uh, strong views, are my own views. And I think it will be quite clear to everybody that they are indeed my own views because uh, uh, they're not the, uh, necessarily the views of the OECD and uh, nor of the uh, Financial Stability Board that I attend on behalf of the OECD. So um, <clears throat> because I do have some critical comments and, uh, and uh, therefore... Um, uh, you'll tell quite easily that they're my own comments. Um, with regard to uh, this talk today, then, um, the let me. I'm, I'm not going to go through all this. What I'm going to do is focus on not on the macro side of this, uh, on the macro side of this issue, because uh, believe me when I say that there's a there's a macro and a micro regulatory side of this uh, crisis, and uh, the macro uh, side of it is equally as important as the uh, as the micro side of it. You know, if you think about a a big dam of water filling up, uh, you know, with uh, with uh, with water and the pressure on the dam or building that that big water pressure in the dam uh, was the uh, global liquidity boom that preceded this crisis, which is all to do with things about low interest rates, but most importantly with the fixed exchange rate regimes with countries like China, which recycle their uh, reserves back into the uh, back into the West, and which drives bubbles in financial markets and so on. But I'm not going to uh, address all of those, and so don't. Um, don't take any notice of the first few slides I flicked past to get to where I'm starting because there's a couple of scary ones there which you think you've got. I hope he wasn't going to talk about that. <laughs> there's the scary one. Okay, so I'm going to start on uh, this one. Um, so I'm starting on the micro. So if you thought about that water pressure in the dam, 
uh, there's some cracks in the wall, and it's the cracks in the wall that I want to talk about, uh, the, the real problem there that, um, uh, that uh, we, we're all trying to deal with and addressing that Larry Summers point about what should the future shape of the financial system look like. And I can tell you uh, people don't know what it should look like. Uh, now, in our role at the uh, G20 and the, um, the Financial Stability Board, uh, there's the things that they have sort of agreed upon, uh, and I'll just quickly list them, are uh, <coughs> capital rules, uh, you know, counter-cyclical capital rules, leverage ratios, those kind of things. When I say they've agreed on them, what they've agreed is that by 2010, that's like some time away, the end of 2010, that they will have agreed on what the rules for capital and buffers and all that will be. Uh, and that by 2012 they should be implemented, but they haven't told you what they are. They're going to agree on them in the next year. So um, still plenty of room for some, uh, uh, for some input there. But um, the capital rules, accounting rules, uh, back office, uh, credit rating agencies, everyone's on top of banging on the credit rating agencies. That was obviously, they think, a big, uh, big cause of this crisis. Underwriting standards, over-the-counter derivatives, their clearing in centralised exchanges, and, of course, compensation and bonus issues, which both in Europe and in this country are, are, are almost an explosive political issue. Um, so they're the things that uh, um, uh, most people have really uh, focused on. And what I really want to talk to you about is uh, whether that's enough. Uh, you know, is that it, if we did get all those things right, and that's a big if, if we did get all those things right, would that be enough uh, to fix everything? And as you'll see as we proceed through this presentation, my answer is... Definitely not. Uh, that is not enough uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And so um, we have to start at the beginning, and, uh, and I'm going to talk about a few areas on this first slide, but I want to start at the beginning. And when I say the beginning, I mean the beginning. Uh, you know, if you're thinking about this problem that Larry Summers was trying to give principles for yesterday, um, you know, you have to say, what's the basic problem? You know, wh wh what is it? Instead of all these little things that we're reforming, what actually is the most basic problem that we're trying to address? That's the thing you have to start from. And when you go through that and try to get the key things related to that, uh, we, so we sort of will play a little game as we go along. Uh, and that little game is um, uh, that, uh, that, that uh, children's board game, uh, which I sort of like as a you know, motivating device, uh, that children's board game called Cluedo. You know where... Um, you know that game where about who killed Dr. Black, you know, uh, was it Scarlet in the bathroom with a dagger? Uh, and, you, and you pull out all these cards and you're getting these clues and sometimes you get really good clues and sometimes you get really sort of red herring clues that don't, uh, that don't give you much clue about who, who killed Dr. Black after all. So we're trying to find out the real clues, you know, which ones really matter and which ones don't matter. And of course, uh, um, you'll, you'll see as we go along why I think some of the things that they're talking about uh, all of the things they're doing, don't, don't misunderstand me. I think they're important, you know, and I, I want to do them. And we're, in, I'm, we're involved in, uh, in, 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 in recommending things to improve them. But uh, are they the key thing or not? Because as you'll see on my slide here, the key thing is shown there at the top uh, as you come to that arrow into the green. The key problem in banking, and if anyone who doesn't understand this, uh, and I think there's a lot of regulators who just forget about this and go straight into the technical detail, the key thing about banking is the is the conflict between creditors of banks and equity holders of banks. And that's what I mean by equity culture. So the, bi the biggest problem, the thing we're trying to deal with is that sometime in the 1990s, uh, the equity culture in banking took over from the credit culture in banking. Uh, the equity holders got the upper hand, if you like. Uh, and that is the, is the great problem in banking that we have to deal with today, that the equity culture took over from the credit culture and the equity culture, I mean, there are many aspects to it, but the simplest aspect of the equity culture is, um, which is what the regulatory, the theoretical regulatory problem is, is that creditors, in a sense, um, write a put to the equity holders. You know, basically that put is that the creditor is like a depositor, like all of you have a bank deposit, so you're a creditor of the bank. Um, you write it, you, but you're writing a put to the equity holders of that bank because you're going to get a coupon, just a little interest rate and your money's going to be safe. Uh, that's all you're getting. Uh, but the equity holder, what, he has an a asymmetric position. If the bank does really badly and makes a big mistake in taking risk, he can lose everything, his whole equity deposit, but there's a limit to that and that limit is equal to zero. He just loses all of his in equity investment. But on the upside, he has an unlimited possibility. So he wants the bank to take risk 
because if he doesn't take risk and just puts his money in your bank deposit, uh, then he can't get that unlimited upside. So the equity holder always wants you to go for the unlimited upside. And even though there's a small chance on, uh, you know, like a one in three years or one in five years or 10 years, whatever it is, that the risk he takes may risk the bank, uh, that doesn't matter because the returns you're going to get as the equity holder uh, are very, very high. But the creditor, you, you know, you, you, you don't want him to do that. Uh, and so that's the basic problem. Uh, a credit culture is where uh, what a bank is supposed to do. If you read any simple first-year textbook, and all of your politicians uh, will all think this, they'll all be thinking, yes, what a bank is is this. A bank, well, it takes deposits, uh, it keeps a bit of capital aside for a rainy day, and uh, then it lends, and it lends to households and to smaller, medium-sized businesses. Why does it do this? Because someone has to create pr private information about households and small businesses because they're too small to issue into the capital market. So that's what the role of banking is. So they take deposits, keep a bit of capital, and they lend to smaller, medium-sized businesses and to households who can't raise money in their own name in the capital market. That's what banks are, right? Uh, and uh, no, that's not what banks are. That's part of the problem. Uh, and so we'll see that this changing equity culture that came about in, as the 1990s progressed uh, is, a real, uh, uh, a re is really the heart of this problem and uh, the things that deal with it. Now, what I'm going to do is these um, four sort of titles here, um, derivatives and um, the big arbitrage opportunities that were there, the... SEC rule changes and leverage and the Glass-Steagall removal were all the four factors that uh, were the key thing in the, switch, uh, in the switch away from the credit culture in banking to the equity culture. Those four things together uh, combined to do this. Now, let's just take the first of those, the, the derivatives, uh, the credit default swaps. Now... I want you to have a good look at this graph because when we play this game of Cluedo, um, you know, here we've got a very interesting clue already. If you look closely, like if you're a good Cluedo player, you really look at the card closely and you figure out whether it's got, uh, uh, whether it's got some meaning for you or not. And the one thing you notice about this, this is credit default swaps, not notional amounts outstanding. Um, now, this is probably one of the most striking graphs you'll ever see in your life. If you look at the magnitudes on the left-hand side, if you just look at those magnitudes, it's mind-boggling. Uh, you know, people, what people think is a big number out there in the, uh, in the markets. But if you look to this period around here, you'll see in the first half of, and you see this modest growth like that, in the first half of 2004, credit default swaps were about $5 trillion outstanding. So that looks like a small number. I mean, $5 trillion is actually quite an enormous number, but $5 trillion outstanding. And then look what happens. From 2004 onwards, suddenly what was a fairly flat pattern like that goes parabolic, parabolic up. And by the time you get to, uh, to uh, the 2007 in the middle of the year, we're talking about credit default swaps, 62 trillion outstanding in the space of just a few years. Now that, you will never see a graph like that again in your whole lives, I suspect, in financial markets of a magnitude like that and of a speed with which it builds up. It's one of the most striking things you'll ever see. So the question is, uh, where's the clue for the Cluedo game? The clue is that, boy, something happened in 2004. Uh, that's one of the clues to what really matters here because before that, and if everything had gone on uh, as, uh, as it was going on before 2004, we wouldn't be standing here and sitting here today talking about you know, the global financial crisis. It wouldn't be, there wouldn't have been one. Uh, so basically the issue then is, why was 2004 such a special year? Now, this is for the, uh, in, in case there's any specialists in the house, because uh, I want to talk about, just give you an, il an illustration about the second box. So we saw some of the credit derivatives and we found 2004 was an important clue. Uh, now there's a couple of things here. Um, the first one of which was um, the Basel rules. Um, now, you know, my personal view, uh, again, certainly not the OECD or the Financial Stability Board view, is that the Basel II system uh, is so flawed that I don't even know, you know, I don't know that it can be saved as a, uh, saved as a, uh, um, uh, or whether it should be uh, saved as a, uh, as a concept for uh, risk management in banks. That's my, uh, that's my personal view. Uh, but, um, but basically, uh, you can see the sort of problems with it immediately um, that, uh, and again, it's a bit for the specialist, but the two, 
the two things in that second box were tax and Basel II because what happened in, uh, in, in 2007 with credit default swaps, what you see in an explosion of credit default swaps like that is an explosion of leverage in the financial system, an absolute explosion of leverage. Now, the, uh, um, the, the thing that um, the Basel system did is that what it also, when you're pulling out the Cluedo cards, it also had um, a, a number on it which is very important to notice because one of the things that happened with Basel has the number 2004 written on it. In 2004, they published Basel II and they went through in the second half of the year what was called the QIS4 simulations where this is this... Um, um, I'm sorry to speak frankly because it does make my blood boil, this Basel II, but this, this mindless idea that you should give to the people who want to have the equity culture... You should give to them the role of modelling their own risk, so that they could they could decide their own capital weights. You know, you know, regulators won't do it. The banks will do it themselves, and then they'll tell the regulator how much capital they should think should should hold for their risk. Now, if you've ever worked in a bank, this giving the equity the equity the equity culture people the extra degree of freedom to help determine how much capital they're going to have to hold, which is a cost to their company and something that pushes their share price down. Uh, like, I mean, you just can't even begin to imagine why people would think that. Uh, ne yet, nevertheless, that's what the, uh, the regulators thought would be a good idea. Uh, and so th and I've shown this, uh, this slide here uh, uh, to regulators, and, uh, and I tell you, uh, in the FSB context, and I can tell you the, uh, you know, the, the, light, you know, like the light was going on. So I said that one of the things that caused this explosion in, in leverage was the publication of Basel II in 2004. And then I always got one of the regulators would put up his hand and say, excuse me, Adrian, you know, <laughs> I hate to have to tell you this, mate, but um, the uh, Basel II isn't due to come in until 2008. Uh, and here you are talking about something that started in 2004 and you're saying it was Basel II's publication in 2004, but it wasn't going to be implemented to 2008. And I say, thank you. I'm really glad you asked that question because uh, it shows me that, um, that you've obviously never worked in a bank and uh, have no idea how people think in banks. And, and you know, that's very indicative of the regulatory problem. Uh, and it is. Because in Citigroup, where I worked at the time, Let's look at the, the, third, uh, the third dot point. Under the Basel I system, again, this is for the specialists in the room, but you have, to keep, you have to weight your assets according to their risk under Basel. And when you weight it all up, the risky things have a higher weight, the lower risk things have a lower weight. And then when you weighted it all up, you have your 4% and your 8% applied to that risk-weighted base. And obviously, the lower your weights, uh, the lower the amount of assets you have to hold capital against. So banks are obviously trying to get this number as small as they possibly can. But in 2004, as soon as they knew what Basel was uh, going to be, even though it hadn't been introduced, banks don't work like that. I mean, once the system knew, you start, fa you know, stock prices are determined on looking way out into the future. Uh, you know, regulatory change today affects stock prices forever. Uh, and so Citigroup just did the following thing. They said, okay, so let's get this straight. This is really simple. And when you say this, you know, the lights go on around the room, you know, in the regulars, like, my God, I didn't think of that. Uh, but that's what happens always in, in these things. So what happened in Citigroup is they basically said, so if we keep a mortgage on our balance sheet, it's going to have a 50% weight under Basel I, which is still the operating uh, uh, re regime. Basel I, 50% capital weight for a mortgage. Under our QIS4, where we tested it ourselves, we're actually going to have a capital weight. We're going to give ourselves a capital weight for mortgages of only 20%. So this is going to be fabulously profitable for mortgages. Uh, so that's great. But unfortunately, we can't do that just yet. But actually, in the system at the moment, if you put the mortgage off balance sheet into one of these conduits, it has a zero capital weight. Now we know what the QIS4 telling us what we'll be able to have in 2008 a 20% weight for, uh, for capital, there's a very simple arbitrage. You just say, what percentage of my deposits, of my um, mortgages, do I keep on my balance sheet with a 50% weight? And what percentages of my mortgages do I keep off my balance sheet with a 0% weight that gives me the 20% 20, 20 weight I'm going to need in 2008? And the answer is pretty simple when it's 20%. You keep 40% of your uh, mortgages on your balance sheet and you put 60% of your mortgages off your balance sheet. And as you can see, 
40 times 50 is 20%, 40% times 50, 50% of 40% is 20%, and 60% 60, 60 of uh, zero is, uh, is zero. And, uh, and so basically you got your 20% just by moving all that off balance sheet. Go and have a look at the 2007 accounts of Citigroup, and you'll see down there at the bottom there that the, that the mortgages are off balance sheet that Citigroup are had sure as night follows day were about 60% of their whole balance sheet. And, and this was pretty standard practice. But the regulators had no idea. Uh, so that's uh, the first point. Basel's system was helping increase leverage. The other system, bank, banks, by the way, were, uh, were proud of this. I had some quotes there from Germany, German banks, uh, uh, UK banks, and uh, US banks, and so on. Um, now, uh, the second little element uh, that's been sitting there for a long time, and again, uh, this is something that um, without mentioning any names, just never ceases to amaze me. But every single time I make this point in front of a senior policymaker, uh, which happened only recently in the FSB context, people say, my God, you know, that is really interesting. Is there anything written on this? Now, here we are talking about people way more senior than me uh, who don't know some of the most basic things what was driving this crisis. And they say, wow, that's an interesting point. Is there anything written on that? Now, you know, you know it, it, it's frightening. It's, it, to me, it's seriously frightening because the structured products, anyone, any, if you go, if, instead of talking to uh, mem, you know, board members or something like that of a bank, go and talk to someone who got fired from the structured products department of one of these banks and ask him what they do. Uh, because... Everybody knows that structured products, which are the heart of this crisis, are tax-driven. Uh, they are a tax-driven uh, phenomenon. And, um, and basically, uh, I, just again for the specialists here, but maybe you can all follow it intuitively, but it's a pretty simple idea. Um, it's, it's a bit like if you've got tax credits and tax advantages that you can't use, then derivatives and investment banks can figure out ways to, to, to share them so that they can use your tax credits and, uh, at, that you can't use. So in the US context, it's pretty simple, uh, and it works something like this, that um, in, the, in your country here, in the US, you have, say, a 45% um, tax rate on the buy-and-hold investor for income and a 15% tax rate on capital gains. Now, that difference between 45 and 15 is really, really important. The broker-dealer has a 35% tax rate on everything. So think of the following little example. Somebody invests in a 100, wants to invest $100 for one year. And um, so the, the, the broker-dealer comes along to them and says, um, OK, you're only getting 2% on your treasury bonds. How would you like to get a AAA security, 100% guaranteed by AIG, and, um, and it's going to be a 5% return for you? And you say... Done. Okay, done. So you take that, and that's a promise that in one year's time, you give me $100, in one year's time I'll give you $105 back, and you'll pay $0.45 cents in the dollar on your $5 income declared to the tax man. Now, what do I do, the broker-dealer? I set this up in the Cayman Islands in a tax haven. I now invest in a triple B security. Now, this is a very important point because it throws a whole new light on the way regulators are thinking about this, but this is what we did you would throw the thing into a triple B security. Now, on a triple B security, you know with 100% certainty that you're going to lose 20% of that investment. That's what they are. You know, that's the kind of arithmetic that, that, that goes with them. And you're going to get, uh, on the lower tranches of these things, you're going to get like a 25% return on a very high-risk high security. So what we do is we give you your $100 uh, investment in a triple B security. What you're really getting is a security which is going to give you a $20 loss and a $25 income. Now, you don't know that, uh, but you're going to declare this to the tax man, $100 safe capital and a $5 income. Now, this is perfectly legal in this country. In a tax haven, you can be opaque between the capital and the income. So what, that, what basically happens is, is that uh, we invest in the triple B security, we get a separate CDS contract for you, so you're guaranteed from AIG. Uh, and then we declare the $20 loss on, the, uh, on this thing we set up for you, this CDO in the Cayman Islands. Uh, we get a $20 loss on that. And at the 35% tax rate, we get a tax deduction from Uncle Sam. Now, the reason we can do that is because 
if I gave you the triple B security and you got the $25 income and had to declare the $20 loss, you would only be able to claim the loss on your $20 back at 15% because that's what your capital gains tax is. But I can claim it back at 35%. So that's why I can give you a higher yield and give something to me too. And because the asset I'm setting up for you is often a synthetic CDO, which is based on derivatives, all these CDS things, because it's a synthetic CDO, I don't have to buy the underlying. Now, this is what is staggering about it. Remember that graph, how it goes up to the 60 trillion? This is what's staggering about it. If I get 35% tax deduction on the $20 loss I made for you that you don't know about, that comes straight into my company, so it's Citigroup. I didn't have any outlays. Now, do you remember your junior high school arithmetic about you take a number and you divide by zero? Uh, what, uh, what is it? So I take my income from Uncle Sam, I divide by my outlay of zero because I set this up as synthetic products derivatives where the outlay is like cross enough to zero. Then what I'm getting is an infinite rate of return by this process, an infinite rate of return. Now, that kind of, that kind of possibility in your own system is madness. You know, it is just absolutely madness. See, it's like leaving $500 on the ground outside your apartment and expecting, uh, you know, someone not to pick it up. Uh, and you come back tomorrow morning, it'll still be there. Of course banks are going to take advantage of these things. Of course they are. You know, it's just human nature. It's greed and it's human nature and people will do it. If you have it there, it's going to be taken advantage of. The, the third slide was... Uh, um, uh, the um, leverage and uh, and so on and um, and here I want to talk about the um, uh, again remember one of the Cluedo clues we've got um, is um, um, 2004 and something else happened in th many things happened in 2004 um, I'm not even going to talk about some of them but one of the things that happened in 2004 probably the Probably the single most important thing that happened in 2004 in terms of the, uh, the, the timing and the suddenness of this crisis uh, was uh, your own regulators, the SEC, uh, 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 caused this one. Uh, it was really, um, you know, basically uh, how to uh, get a gun and shoot yourself in the head type of a policy. It was, I mean, literally, I mean, it was, it was that. Uh, what happened in 2004 was that the SEC used to... Um, regulate the broker dealing arms of investment banks only and they did so in quite a tough way and broker dealer is where a lot of this activity goes on and the leverage ratio for the broker dealers was around 15 uh, and that was a pretty tight cap on them because as you, you'll notice that tax arbitrage was there for quite a long time uh, it needed two things that tax arbitrage needed two things to be taken advantage of the CDS contracts, which were kind of one of the big new innovations, a big developing liquid market in CDS, it needed that, but it also needed leverage in investment banking uh, so that you could just lever up these positions. So those were the two things you needed. So the derivatives came along, and then in 2004, the good old SEC uh, basically decided to do the following. Due to pressure from the investment banks, who are big global firms, here we're talking about Lehman's and so on and so forth, uh, they're big global firms. To operate in the, you know, in the uh, Europe, you needed to be supervised or regulated on a consolidated entities basis. Supervising only the broker-dealers was not enough. You needed to be supervised on a consolidated entity basis and it was good enough to be uh, supervised as a whole consolidated entity according to European standards. Now, if you have a look at um, European standards, they didn't have uh, something that you have in this country because, as you'll see as my talk progresses, uh, uh, the, um, the, this country has been really well served by one regulatory group and, and, and not by any others, as far as I can see. And that, that regulatory group is the FDIC. I think they are easily the best in this country. If it wasn't for the FDIC, this country would have a huge problem right now because the FDI, FDIC uh, basically got through Congress, say, in 1991, um, the FDIC Act, which imposed essentially a leverage ratio in the United States independently of the Basel system. But they don't have that in Europe. And so, basically, once uh, it was agreed that the SEC would supervise investment banks as a consolidated entity according to European standards, then the US investment bank leverage ratio, which used to be around 15, these are the two years before the crisis. I deliberately picked a stop just as the crisis was about to hit. You see US investment banks, you would have seen it moving up from 15 to sort of 27, 
And then by the time you got to just before the crisis, the leverage ratio got to 35. This is the amount of assets you have divided by the capital that you have. So you're leveraging up the company. Um, what are they leveraging it up with? Doing all these deals in structured products and things that I've been talking about. So US investment banks came to have, look at the European banks leverage rate. This is not investment banks. This is more or less like big universal banks that do everything. They already have a leverage ratio of 37 and the, uh, the SEC allowed US investment banks to be able to compete with them in Europe uh, to have the same leverage ratio as Europe. As I said, this is like, uh, in terms of the analogy of our water in the dam, you know, with the pressure was building up because of all these global liquidity issues, this was the SEC opening the sluice gate on the side to push that final amount of water through that would burst through the dam wall, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, the leverage just exploded, those CDS contracts all got levered up, uh, and, and away we went. And here's uh, another one of those Cluedo clues. You can see here again, this is uh, residential mortgage-backed securities uh, that, uh, that came on the mill uh, then. And you see there um, business loans being securitised, commercial mortgages, consumer credit and so on. But there's only one that stands out and that's the residential one, the home mortgages. And once again you see that uh, in 2004 uh, suddenly that series, just like the CDS contracts, goes parabolic parabolically up. So the big change in 2004 uh, was a massive, uh, a massive kind of a phenomenon. Uh, and you'll see that there. And of course, uh, there were other things in 2004, like um, some, this is a good example of how social policy cuts across other things, but uh, uh, President Bush uh, introduced the American Dream legislation in 2004, which was to take uh, no equity loans to lower income households, uh, which it's literally called the American Dream policy. Uh, that provided the underlying uh, assets so that people could do this kind of securitization. So all of these things came together in 2004. Now I'm going to come to the competition side of this um, and uh, let me, um, because competition, uh, what I'm trying to get to is what what's, should be on the agenda about this equity culture uh, and, um, and what isn't, isn't on the agenda being addressed in the forum that I go to. Uh, you know, and I think it's missing the most important parts and you'll see why as we go forward here. But if you have a look at this graph, and you're going to have to forgive me for, um, um, you know, if it was some other country, I would be happy to talk about it as another country. I just have to declare my interest in that I am an Australian. Uh, however, um, if I wasn't an Australian, I'd be trying to make the same point. Um, if you have a look at this graph, you'll see five countries um, represented there, France, Germany, UK, US and Australia. And you'll see the um, percentages of assets that the bank concerned, uh, that the, the top four banks in each country control, and, the, and you get the total. So the Australian top four banks, the big ones, um, 76.8. By the way, any of these banks, which only a few years ago would have seemed small banks in comparison to the Citigroups and the Wells Fargo's and so on and so forth, uh, virtually all of those banks have Australian banks have market caps which are larger than uh, uh, larger than most of the famous name big banks in Europe and uh, and the US now their market capitalization is higher uh, because of uh, the fact that they didn't have any of this crisis whatsoever. Uh, not one single Australian bank has received one dollar of capital injection to any uh, to help them out in any way, shape, or form. Uh, the only thing that happened in Australia to match the pressures coming from abroad was the deposit insurance issues, you know, extending deposit insurance and the like. So no bank in Australia received one single dollar of anything like TARP or whatever, nothing. Those top four Australian banks, which control 76% of the, uh, the, the, the assets of the banking system, every single one of them is AA rated, which is about the highest ranking you can have in a bank. Uh, and all of them, those four banks, are ranked in the top 20 safest banks in the world. Um, You'll see the USA has uh, Wells Fargo there, which has uh, got a double A, uh, but, um, but otherwise none of those top banks uh, make it into the top 50 safest banks in the world. And um, you see the UK looking pretty poorly. Um, the Germany's got a couple of uh, OK ones, um, but um, their Landis banks have problems, and, uh, and France looks a lot better. Now, one thing you immediately notice on that chart, by the way, in terms of competition is... Australian top four banks have 77% of the assets. The um, French top four banks have 81% of the assets. The UK banks have 52%, US 49%, and Germany 47%. So the first thing that strikes you is uh, the higher the concentration, the safer the banking system, it seems, and the lower the concentration, the more dangerous the banking system might be, uh, just from something as simple as that. 
But the main point I wanted to make to you is, because we're playing this game of Cluedo, remember, is so, wait a minute, wait a minute, didn't Adrian say that at the FSB and all of that, we're looking at the key things about reforming credit rating agencies, reforming capital rules, uh, reforming back office, OTC derivatives, etc., compensation. Now, this is very interesting because ask yourself the following questions. Did Australia have to deal with the same Basel Committee as your country and the European countries? Yes. Did Australia have more capital than uh, the US did? No, actually Australian banks had less capital than the US did. Less capital. They didn't have one dollar spent on them, but less capital. Uh, did they have the same credit rating agencies? Exactly the same companies doing exactly the same job in Australia as they did here. Exactly the same. Uh, did they have OTC derivatives? Of course they did. Did they have access to securitisation? Of course they did. Um, compensation. When I worked in Citigroup in Australia, did I get a bonus scheme just like they get in New York? Of course I did. Had all of those things the same. But not one dollar was spent on saving an Australian bank. Now this is a very important Cluedo clue because it says, hang on, reforming all of those things, maybe that's not where the main game in town is. Maybe that's not the key thing. Because it didn't happen in Australia, why was that? They had all the same stuff, but it didn't happen there. So this is really uh, one, we're, we're one of the places that I want to go in terms of getting these clues to come through. Now, the, the reason, I'm going to take, take you into now the reasons why this is so. Because complexity in derivatives and leverage is where this equity culture came from. This is what you're all paying taxes now to solve. And here we have, um, I can only get this data. This data is very hard to get because, you know, nobody likes to report all their derivative positions and so on and so forth, but you can actually get it. So this is uh, structured notes. Now, these structured notes are the tranching things that banks use to fund their activities uh, with derivative type of base products. Now, since the crisis started, or just before, March 07 is when I can get data from, these index tranche uh, volumes, in terms of when they are issued, 14.2 trillion through the crisis period has been issued in these notes. Structured notes, 14.2 trillion has been issued just in the crisis period alone. And then and the names of the of the banks who are issuing them. Well, there you go. There's the um, there's just pretty much reads like a list of those big, too big to fail banks around the world. Uh, um, you see, Citi, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Lehman's, Deutsche Bank, Kalyan, which is the Credit Agricole investment banking part, uh, BNP Paribas, Socgen, UBS, Barclays. Now, <clears throat> you know, they are the big names. These are the names. These are the ones that have to be saved type of places, uh, and they're issuing this stuff. And by the way, they're still issuing it right now. And this is the uh, collateralized synthetic obligation. The minute telling you you set up an asset for someone like who wants to invest in mortgages where you don't even have to, you don't even have to buy the underlying. These are these synthetic obligations uh, and 3.4 trillion have been issued uh, before the crisis, by the way, it was much more. 3.4 trillion have been issued through the crisis. Uh, you know, these are these things, you know, you'd think that they'd have a system in place, wouldn't you? You'd, you'd imagine that if there was a synthetic security based on underlying mortgages, that you shouldn't allow more synthetic security claims on those mortgages than there are mortgages. But actually, it's multiple numbers. Uh, so, you know, like the s d derivatives are making claims on the same pieces of asset uh, many times over. This is all a part of what leverage and derivatives do and why the system is so prone to, uh, uh, so prone to problems. And these are, again, some of the, uh, the names on the synthetic... Uh, uh, the collateralized synthetic obligation side. Once again, Citigroup, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, Lehman Brothers, Deutsche Bank, Kalyan, BNP, Socgen, UBS. You know, it, it reads like a cast of rogues, and uh, and uh, and of course that's what it is. Uh, notice that there isn't a single Australian bank mentioned as one of the big issuers of these type of products, which is a, an important clue in our in our game. Now, remember the last one of those four bars on my initial slide was um, the removal of Glass-Steagall and uh, as a part of the, the things, this, this cocktail that came together to cause an explosive equity culture in banking. Now, just prior to Glass-Steagall, those of you who know Glass-Steagall, Glass-Steagall was the act passed in the Great Depression uh, because of the problems that arose in the Great Depression that basically said, isn't the problem... I mean, like, your forefathers, you know, were very wise uh, and... Uh, 
and uh, and more recently have been very unwise in unwinding the what their grandfathers did. But what their grandfathers said is, boy, isn't what happened in the Great Depression uh, that when these banks got into trouble, contagion risk was the major issue. That is, they're risky parts. Do you think taking a deposit and lending to someone who's got a reasonable job and an income for a mortgage is a risky business? No, that's not a risky business. That's not risky business at all. But if you have a bank like that and you plop an investment bank inside of it and an insurance company inside of it and all the rest of it who do take risky decisions, then what contagion risk is is if your investment bank, which has now become a part of your bank, blows up, it can blow up the capital of the entire group. And that's exactly what happened. Glass-Steagall in the Great Depression said, OK, from now on, Commercial banks can't own insurance companies and securities companies. And in 1999, after extreme pressure and lobbying from the yours truly of those previous graphs, so extreme lobbying uh, they had by the graham leach Bliley Act in 1999 removed. Now, that was already a done deal. graham leach Bliley was basically just crossing the T's and dotting the I's of what was uh, already been changes in Fed rules that allowed takeovers to happen, as you can see on this chart, uh, in the lead up to that legislation going through. They allowed them to start doing it in 97, 98, and the final act was kind of stamped in 1999. But you see there that once that was on the agenda, then, um, uh, then banks taking over other banks and investment banks, or banks that contained investment banks, was in the range of 1% to 3% of GDP every year for after, uh, after the, uh, the Glass-Steagall Act was removed. And of course, this is all about competition, competition for corporate control. Because remember what I'm trying to tell you here is that, that when these derivatives came along, this is the sort of way to think of it, when these derivatives came along, there was new possibilities to do new businesses through structured notes, which I just showed you. You could expand your balance sheets through these structured notes. A uh, very profitable way to grow quickly. Growing quickly is how you drive the share price up and how you get your bonuses and all the rest of it. So that was a really important channel. Uh, having an investment bank was essential to doing that. Commercial banks can't underwrite these structured products. You've got to have an investment bank, so buy the investment banks and whack them in there as well. Then the good old SEC says, and by the way, uh, let's throw some real gin into the punch bowl now and you can, uh, you can lever up your positions you know, uh, three or four times what you used to be able to do in doing all of this activity. So they did that. And so all these things started coming together from 2004 and Wooshka, off it all went, into these highly complex products uh, that, um, that are we, now know, we now call uh, toxic products, but uh, they weren't called toxic at the time. Uh, and of course, um, uh, the, the market for corporate control is a part of that pressure, this competition pressure. Uh, that drives people. You know, if you're the CEO of Citigroup, you don't want to be taken over by somebody else. You want to take somebody else over. Uh, there's new businesses here. There's share price. There's rewards. You've got to take your market share. You've got to get in. You've got to have it. And so you take other people over. You don't even take you over. So the corporate, uh, the corporate governance really becomes a, uh, an issue of... Um, uh, of taking these new businesses and driving up the share price and getting the rewards in your bonus system and so on and so forth. Now, the, I'm coming to the sort of last part of this and we'll open it up to questions, but the last part of it is where I, I want you to pay most attention uh, because it is really quite an interesting, uh, um, uh, a really interesting phenomenon. When, when you think about this crisis, you can break it up into five, five basic uh, steps that are, have to be done. Um, and step number one is obviously the emergency measures. Now, you know, as the, uh, um, you know, do we have, did we have to do those emergency measures? Well, you know, of course. Um, you know, the, we didn't want to be starting from that position. You know, it's just like the, the American lost in the English countryside is in the absolutely the wrong place to get back to London, ask the local farmer, how do I get back to London? And he says, well, you shouldn't be starting from here. Uh, and, and we shouldn't have been starting from here. But given that we were starting from what I've just, the end result of what I was just describing, um, then, um, well, uh, you had to have the emergency measures because the alternative position is, um, you know, right now you'd be, uh, you know, sitting in your cellars with cans of spam or something because, you know, you can't imagine how bad this could have been uh, if the whole financial system collapsed. Uh, and it would have, uh, like no doubt it would have. So um, those things I had to do. But then what do you have to do after that? There are two basic routes from that point on in terms of the second two points, remove the toxic assets and recapitalise the, uh, re the banks. Uh, and to do, the, to do it in the way that uh, the RTC and uh, stuff did it under the SNL crisis and uh, other places like the Swedish people did it in the early 1990s is a nationalisation route, essentially. Uh, it's ridiculous, really, to think that 
shareholders should be saved. You know, the whole point of being a shareholder is you have that zero limit. And once you did take too much risk, you've got to pay the penalty of going to zero. You get nationalised. The government takes off the toxic assets and then resells the bank to the, to the new investors in the bank, all cleaned up. But uh, in Europe and America, they decided not to do that. And instead, they went down what I call the forbearance route. And I'll come, to, come back to that at a moment. Uh, and then eventually you have to exit from all the things that you do uh, and, uh, and you have to then make sure it never happens again by having a financial system where the future shape of it is defined to be in a way that takes account of what's really important to take account of, which is kind of where I'm going to. Um, I, won't, I won't dwell on these charts here, except I'll just say two things, is that at the OECD we've done some calculations. We don't do what the IMF does, uh, which is uh, essentially um, runs uh, regressions, uh, um, uh, you know, different methodologies. I, I don't criticise them. It's much easier to run a regression of supply and demand on, and then get some, you know, I think poorly determined equations and say this is what they forecast and here are the losses. Um, but the alternative method is to is, is to go down into individual bank names, the you know the banks that are uh, have got the positions and things that cause trouble, and have a look at uh, what they're saying themselves and add it all up from the bottom up. And we tend to go down that route to some extent, uh, and um, we have uh, um, just just to cut to the chase on all this. Uh, if you look at the very last line underneath the table, uh, what that shows you is that for the losses that we calculate, remember that 2010 is where we're supposed to put in the new capital rules. What you see down the bottom of that is allowing for the highest ever possible earnings period in banking history in this country, uh, which is about 1.5% earnings on your assets in an underlying sense. That's about as good as you've ever done. Uh, that if you can do that, uh, then how many years would it take you to earn the capital through that uh, to pay back all the losses that we see in the past and, and that we still see coming? And the answer is from 2010 when the new capital rules are supposed to come in, after that it'd still be three and a half years in this country to do that. Now it's not really going to be three and a half years if you can issue equity as well. This is calculating saying if you do it all by earnings only. So already banks are starting to issue equity so you can shorten it to the extent that you can dilute existing shareholders, uh, then you can, uh, you can shorten that period. Uh, but if you thought there was a problem here, and there is, uh, then uh, in terms of the uh, Europeans, uh, as I said, they didn't have the FDIC uh, and they really believed in all this Basel nonsense. And, uh, and of course, um, in that case, uh, they have no capital in Europe, uh, you know, very little. And so uh, for them to catch up to the US in capital, because remember they're thinking about maybe the US needs more capital, uh, but for them just to catch up to the US is already a trillion dollars they have to raise just to catch up to where you are today uh, in terms of having some capital behind these banks. And um, so we calculate that for them it could be something like six years of earnings after 2010. And that, by the way, uh, doesn't take account of any off-balance sheet activities. In the previous uh, graph with the US, we are able to get because of your, uh, you know, your own uh, accounting uh, um, uh, and SEC kind of reporting requirements, if you go through the 10K filings of the individual banks, you can find, you know, you might have to look on page 87, you know, bottom half, tiny table, small print, you can still find the, uh, um, the off-balance sheet special purpose entities that the, the banks have been using. They have to report them and they also have to calculate their uh, maximum loss exposures to those entities, which is what we've used in uh, the previous graph to calculate uh, uh, those potential losses. But in the case of Europe, six years if you don't count uh, anything they've got off-balance sheet, and we can't work that out at all because in Europe they're so untransparent that you don't know what their off-balance sheet exposures are. They're probably big. Don't even get me started on Fannie and Freddie, who are already now, uh, you know, I'll just leave that aside, but that's one of the big elephants in the room as well. Um, and I'll skip past all the uh, credit crunch issues because you know there's a credit crunch and it's going to have a big impact on the economy. Now, let's start here, though, um, in terms of the way that the policymakers have decided to go. Now, um, what this uh, chart shows is um, equity returns on this axis and growth on this axis, pretty simple. And like we used to think that we were somewhere like at point A and, um, you know, that over very long periods of time, uh, you know, 20 years or something like that, uh, if you had a balanced portfolio, you could make about 11% returns and GDP growth would be sort of in that 6 7% sort of range on over, over the cycles. And so that's what you could assume if you're a long-run investor to be the sort of world you're talking about. And we know after this crisis that a lot of that dream was built on... Um, 
you know, was built on leverage in the entire post-war period, building up every year, so it was probably unsustainable. So we know we're probably moving to a point like B, but of course we're starting down from that bottom star, which is where we are at the moment, in a recession and uh, negative market returns. Now, when you've got a leverage problem, too much debt, there are only two ways to get rid of that known to man. Uh, one way is by increasing your saving. Now, that is the Great Depression route. You know, that is, if you're going to save your way out of this, it's going to take you long and it's going to be painful. And this is one of the problems with this crisis and uh, with the market behaviour at the moment. You know, I keep saying to myself, apart from the temporary workers and people having to go part-time because companies are pretty frightened, uh, for everyone else, show me the pain. You know, where's the pain? Like, it's like investors seem to believe that, like, you know, you go to a hospital with bad cancer and they give you morphine, uh, you're supposed to have the chemo, which is very painful, but you feel good now, so you say, well, okay, well, let's not go to the chemo because I'm feeling great. Uh, and so, in a way, that's kind of what we've got going here. The money's pumping in, the markets are going up, you know, they've put fiscal policy into the economy to get it going again, but actually, we haven't dealt with any of the toxic assets. It's all kind of still sitting there. Uh, we've got all these issues to deal with in the Europe and the US. We don't even know what the future shape of the financial system will be. And the markets are tossing their hats in the air because of this short-run uh, uh, morphine injection that we've got in. So, you know, we know there's going to be more pain. Uh, it has to come uh, in some form or other. But not so much pain if you go the green route, um, which is the inflation route to getting rid of a debt problem. And that's pretty much the way they've decided to go. I call that the forbearance route because... And it can work. Uh, it can work. Um, and the idea of the forbearance route is to say, let's pretend we don't have a problem. Let's keep everything pumped up. Uh, let's um, let's hope that banks can, uh, because if we keep rates at zero and there's a positive yield curve, then the underlying earnings can be at their maximum for banks. So every day that goes by in time, uh, there's more earnings that they can recapitalise with. And, uh, and secondly, in a rising equity market, spreads down, equities up, uh, banks can issue new equity, and that's what we need to see as well, raising more capital. So through forbearance and time, we can get out of this. And you can. You can get out of it through that kind of a way. Uh, the pain then comes for the... Uh, the poor, I don't own any bank shares because you know this is coming. Uh, you know, you're going to be diluted, uh, rest assured. Uh, and so, you know, the pain comes to the shareholders, which is probably where it should uh, should always have been in the first place. But um, but you go this route here. Now, can it work? Yes, it's a juggling act. You know, you're trying to keep all the balls in the air. If something goes wrong, like a new uh, something, one of these major banks I was showing you involved in these highly structured complex products, you know, blows up again or has to be saved again, those markets will just retrace, uh, and anything like that is called dropping the ball in this game. Now, I'll skip the macro and talk about the new fault line that's emerging. Now, this is what's really uh, this is what's really annoying uh, and really an important point because people are talking about you know we've got to get this sorted, we've got to keep these rates at zero, we've got to recapitalise our banks. Uh, in Europe and the you know the bad guys in this story are Europe and the US, um, and so. In this story, um, you think, you know, we've got to do all this and then we'll sort it all out so we don't have this new bubble arising. Unfortunately, uh, there's already a new bubble arising. You know, the next crisis has already begun. It's not a matter of when, we, you know, to avoid the next crisis. It's started now. It's already, basically, a fault line is occurring across the world. And that fault line is between the US and Europe on the one hand and basically Asia on the other hand. Because Asian countries, while they bring this on themselves in some way through their fixed exchange rate regime, they are importing crisis monetary policy uh, from the United States uh, and, uh, and, of course, that uh, pumps up liquidity in their own economies. And so what we see right across Asia now is property prices are booming everywhere, equity markets are booming everywhere. So the next financial bubble has already started. And let me tell you, this is an interconnected world, just as everybody found out when banks failed here or in Europe, uh, everyone in the end pays the price. So now we're setting up, let's pass this hot potato baby over to Europe, uh, over to Asia, where they can have the bubble and they can have the crisis and that helps us get out of jail. Uh, but it doesn't because the world has still got that big hot potato that it's trying to uh, fix up. You can't just pass this around and there can't be no pain. Uh, so the pain might be delayed, it might, but it's going to come. So... To me, uh, you can see the Chinese stock market almost back to bubble kind of levels. The Korean stock market already above its previous bubble peak uh, and so on and so forth. And property prices, the most worrying of all, right across Hong Kong, uh, um, Korea, uh, you know, the whole Asian region, uh, property prices in China itself are uh, rising again. 
Oh, and by the way, in countries that don't have a fixed exchange rate, and this is, this is a part of the problem of why what the United States is doing is, is causing a problem for everybody. Because the other day, Australia, um, you know, who didn't pay $1 to a bank, uh, wants to exit from this. Having low rates, we think, is bad. You've got to have normal rates, people doing normal business, so that the cost of capital is as it should be. You don't want to be subsidising the next bubble. So Glenn Stevens, our governor, decided to raise rates by a mere 25 bips from 3% to 3.25%. The Australian dollar straight through 90 cents. So just moving a little bit, the Australian dollar. So if, if, if the US doesn't start tightening and Australia doesn't want to have inflation and asset bubbles, you know, we start tightening even a little bit, we're going to have a, you know, two US dollars to the Australian dollar or something, uh, you know, and, and that's going to kill our exports, kill our economy. We can't move until you move uh, anymore, as we, saw, uh, as we saw last week. So this is a real problem, getting, getting rid of all of this. I'll come back to that slide to finish. Um, let me, um, let me, and that one. I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll show you this, but in reverse order, the last three slides. Okay, the um, this one here is one that I think is really the, it's the coup de gras, you know, the the one that really shows you exactly what is going on here, and what is left off the agenda, and what is a major problem in the uh, in the in the world of uh, in the world of finance and banking. Uh, and Larry Summers' principles and all the rest of it, uh, because we've allowed uh, some monsters to emerge in, uh, in the world of banking, and I just don't know what you can do about it. But what you see here is... Uh, can everyone hear me if I point? Um, what you see here is um, loans to assets, and you see here um, Bank of America, Citigroup, uh, Barclays, uh, Black is Deutsche Bank, I know that, uh, and UBS, this one here, and this red one is one of those big four Australian banks, Westpac. And so on the far left-hand uh, bar there, you see the Westpac uh, against, if you take the two extremes, Westpac and Deutsche Bank, Deutsche Bank is one of my real whipping boys in this story, uh, if you take Deutsche Bank and, uh, and Westpac, what does that tell you? You just look at that and you think you're a politician and you, and you actually might actually have a look at some data one of these days, and you say, well, let's have a look at that. Westpac lends its balance sheet, it's actually lending money to real people who do real businesses, who innovate, who are small and medium-sized businesses, and it's got 80% of its balance sheet lending to households and to businesses uh, who do real things and have real returns, uh, who help Australia, uh, and uh, voila, that's what they do. 80% of their balance sheet is in loans. Deutsche Bank. 15% of their balance sheet is in loans. So of all the things this huge German bank does, 15% is lending to businesses who do real things. What else do they do then? Well, they invest in these structured products. You know, they basically issue structured products to investors and they put on the other side of the balance sheet these CDOs and things. That, instead of doing them off balance sheet, which is famous in this country, they just put them on their balance sheet. They're just, they're just big sieves and conduits that are sitting on their balance sheet. So they, they don't have deposits, they have structured notes. And they don't have assets like loans, they have st structured products. So that's what they do. What is, what is Deutsche Bank? Uh, what are these German banks? And what are basically the Citigroups and the, and the Bank of Americas and so on who have you know, like 30 to 40% of their balance sheet in lending to real people who do real things? They're essentially big hedge funds who basically take a spread on either side of their balance sheet with these big derivative products. That's what their business is. That's where they saw their growth, and that's what this equity culture is all about. They don't do what banks are supposed to do. They're big trading organisations who make their money from spreads. And if you look over, uh, um, you look over here, uh, you'll see uh, in terms of... Uh, the, um, the funding side, what's the safest thing for a bank to have is to have stable deposits of mum and dad investors who don't take their money away in a crisis and so on and so forth. Again, Westpac, you know, 50% of its balance sheet is in stable household deposits uh, and Deutsche Bank, 25% of its balance sheet, in in, so it has half the deposit base that Australian... And by the way, they were given some of that through this deal with Deutsche Post Bank. Um, and so uh, then you, uh, um, you think about um, the other part that Australian banks finance themselves with. It's debt, long-term debt issuance. Now, Australian long-term debt for banks is borrowing overseas. 
So when you think about those credit ratings of Australian banks, one of the things that keeps them really honest is that because they're getting deposits and then they're having to borrow the rest from overseas, they have to have a good credit rating. Otherwise, you just can't access that market. And so they keep their credit rating really good. But what they're not doing is these big investment banking you know, structured derivatives products on both sides of their balance sheet to, uh, to, to make this whole thing work. And I want to talk a little bit about contagion risk because when you have banks that look like, uh, say, Deutsche Bank there, um, contagion risk is enormous. You know, this, this little bit of their business can be killed by these parts of their business uh, easily. These are all investment banking activities and it's risky, high-risk business, and that little commercial banking part of their business can just be wiped out entirely by, uh, by the activities of the hedge fund activities. And that's not the case in Australia. So this is contagion risk. And here, this is uh, um, just, uh, again, I want to show you this one because you, it just gives you some insight into what happened in this crisis about contagion risk. Contagion risk is everything. This is one of the end results of what we've all been just been talking about. Your country, Federal Reserve Bank, wrote checks... The Federal Reserve wrote checks equal to these amounts. Goldman Sachs, $12.9 billion check. Société Générale, $11.9 billion check. Deutsche Bank, these are foreign banks. You, you know, your taxpayers are writing checks to foreign banks, $11.9 billion, Barclays, $8.5 billion, and so on. And over here, you see the percentages of the capital of those banks that those payments were. So in the case of, say, um, Deutsche Bank, that payment of a cheque of $11.9 billion from the Federal Reserve to Deutsche Bank was equal to 37.4% of its capital. Now, do you think that there is uh, um, rules by regulators that allow, allow banks to have an exposure, a counterparty exposure, to a bank equal to 37% of its capital? Is that what you think the rules would say? No, no bank is allowed to do that. So did they break any rules? Well, ex post they did. But before the event, they didn't break any rules because this is what happens when you have a system based on these huge hedge fund institutions. On day one, when they put all those trades on, they were well within the counterparty limits that apply to how much you can have exposure to a single entity. But when the crisis emerged, the things you can never predict, you don't know what everyone else owns, you don't know what's going to happen. The prices of these things went haywire. And so suddenly what was a small exposure became a $12 billion exposure to a single entity. And then you're supposed to trade out of it with um, delta hedging. And they're like, you can't trade because no one wants to trade with you. So there you sit with what was perfectly okay you know, one, month, one week before with an exposure now that you can't get paid for. And then if you don't get it, you're going to go bankrupt. And so the Federal Reserve starts writing checks on taxpayers' money. Now, you know, this is a part of the problem. If you let the banking system look like that, this problem will come back time and time and time again. Uh, and so the issues that are not being uh, put on the agenda, maybe I'll just go back and finish there. Uh, let me just tell you why Australia are uh, uh, the key things that I think, and, and you'll see, then I'll finish on it. The key things that Australia has that does differently to the US is, first of all, after our banking crisis of 1991, the, the regulators do not allow um, uh, Australian banks to get involved in the, in, the, in the securities business in any big way. Uh, so they don't own investment banks, those big four banks. Uh, then we have what's called the four pillars policy. It's a government rules that none of those big four banks can take each other over. So the CEOs of those banks don't feel like, boy, if I don't start getting into these new products, you know, then someone's going to take me out. You're not allowed to take them out. That's a deliberate policy of having a stable oligopoly uh, in Australia. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank, the Australian Fed, the Fed of Australia, if you like, is not allowed to be involved in supervision policy. So that's one of the reasons why we had high interest rates to start with, uh, and uh, and and were able to keep keep a, a, the conflict of interest in monetary policy versus supervision policy uh, away. Um, I think that's a, that was quite important. And of course, uh, most importantly of all, as I've already just shown you on the other slide, is that Australian banks, because of those things and because of the regulatory interpretation of what they want banks to do, they basically lend to real people doing real things which have profits that can pay their debts, as opposed to these things that can disappear with a, with a movement of a delta hedged uh, portfolio. Uh, you know, that's what they don't have, and, uh, and that's why the Australian banks never received a dollar. So I'll just start uh, finish there and, um, and just say that the... Um, 
the things not addressed uh, um, in the uh, uh, the things that are addressed. I'm all in favour of them. They're very good things shown at the top there. But the things not addressed are these uh, these points here: uh, the um, too big to fail implicit puts in the equity culture, contagion risk uh, for these big complex products, uh, corporate governance reform. You know, let me just say on, on this thing here. I know that it's political, but it, this this focus on compensation, you know, this is a sideshow. You know, like there's no there's no way that the Treasury should have pays are sitting in the boardroom of companies trying to set their pay. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, the other day, uh, you know, I got a job offer to go back into the private sector, and I asked about other. Oh, what about the pay? You know, the the issue, and they said, don't worry. I mean, it's already sorted. You know, uh, uh, basically, you know how you used to get this one quarter of your uh, pay was your salary. At the end of the year, the other three quarters was your bonus. Well, we're just going to reverse it for you. Uh, so not only do they not have to cap our bonuses, you know, we'll actually cut them for them. You know, we'll, we'll go to a quarter of the... We'll have a quarter of the bonus you had before, a third of the bonus you had before. And, of course, we love that because anyone in Citigroup, you know, they, 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 they didn't want to be... They didn't want to be getting Citigroup shares. You know, your, your job depends on Citigroup to be stuck with Citigroup shares when you get higher salary and then use your excess salary to buy other people's shares and be more diversified. I mean, you know, thank you. You know, we, we love this kind of regulatory reform will be the attitude of uh, this is a sideshow. What's really not a sideshow is getting corporate governance of those firms who set the, set the, uh, the pay scales. That's what you need to fix, uh, and that's what's not being fixed. So I think that's really important. Uh, and, of course, the structure of competition, uh, what banks are supposed to do, uh, and so on. And, um, and the very last uh, uh, tax has to be there. And, of course, in terms of this competition, um, the structure of organisations, and I'll just leave this one up to finish on, uh, that... There is a solution to um, uh, this problem of contagion risk and even with all these things here, you don't have to reintroduce the Glass-Steagall Act uh, in, in this country because there already is a perfectly reasonable corporate form which will solve most of these problems uh, known as a non-operating holding company structure. And that non-operating holding company structure basically says that, say, for Citigroup, the listed parent of Citi would become a non-operating holding company. It would raise capital in the equity market. You'd invest in the non-operating holding company. Then all the other elements, but most importantly, the commercial bank versus the securities arm of the industry, they would be separated, legal entities, separate legal entities with their own governance. And then the non-operating parent would invest capital in the different entities in a transparent way, Given, which would be defined by their, their, their legal status, any analyst would be able to see how much capital the investment bank part of Citigroup has. Because what happens at the moment, it's all mixed in together. And so when Citigroup bank, investment bank goes out to raise capital, how much capital do you have? Oh, we have $60 billion. Uh, and they're, oh, good. But actually, that's someone else's capital as well. It's, all the, you know, it's like shared capital, so you're double gearing the capital all the time. So uh, a non-operating holding company structure is one of the things the OECD is proposing uh, as a part and parcel of things, not on the agenda at the moment, but which are really crucial to address what's really important in this crisis because again those things like um those things like you know capital rules fine uh, but as i said australia had all of those things didn't even have as much capital as your country uh, yet we didn't have a crisis so they're not the most important they're important things but they're not the most important things fixing the equity culture in banking is the most important thing i'll finish there Well, uh, thank you for that uh, uh, fascinating and provocative uh, uh, presentation. Uh, we've got some time for some questions. I, I know we have a, a lot of uh, questions out there. Uh, uh, Danny Mandel uh, has the microphone. Uh, if you'll please introduce yourself and, and identify yourself when asking your question, we appreciate it. Thanks. Yes, my name is Bert Gorowski of the uh, Metropolitan from Venezuela. Uh, on June 24th, 2004, that was the date when the G10 ministers signed the Basel II agreement. And at this moment, we still, it is very hard to find out which were those 10 ministers. <laughs> it's very hard to get those names. You, you spoke very much about the equity side, but I wanted to touch briefly on the other side, which is the risk-taking part. In the 374 pages of the Basel II document, there is not a single word about the purpose of the banks. Not one single word about the purpose of the banks. And this has introduced, with this type of capital requirements, a very imprudent risk aversion. Because the way you give for a bank special incentives to go where there is no risk, where there are triple A's, 
it doesn't mean that the future of the world and that the good of the economy lies in those areas. Mm. Uh, the, the, what the world needs is mostly some good, prudent risk-taking to go ahead, to, to, to forge ahead and get out of its problem, not imprudent risk aversion. So I would like to uh, see if you have some voice on the other side of the, of the picture, not only the equity, uh, favoring the equity side of the, against the credit, but favoring the risk aversion against risk-taking as such. Because this is the first time in history, regulatory history, that really people, regulators, arbitrage, discriminate between risks. Yeah, uh, the, uh, I think that's, uh, that, that is, uh, I, I agree with the sentiment of the question. It's, um, in a way, though, my last slide here is uh, part of uh, my answer to that because you know, w one of the things um, that economists are uh, you know, sup supposed to think of is what would happen if the world had a different set of, uh, of ways companies looked and, and regulations. Now, the key thing about um, a non-operating holding company structure is that um, if, if you think that, um, say, if one of the, th the reason why we got into trouble in the, in the risk-taking was because the typical thing would be, um, say, UBS would raise its treasury would raise capital using the good bank name of UBS at LIBOR, you know, at the really cheap rate, uh, and then it would internally fund investment banking activities by cross-subsidising them because you didn't have separation. So if um, you had separation uh, that actually the investment bank was a separate legal entity that had to have its own capital uh, and, and not be dependent on the capital of everybody else in the group, then the cost of capital to the investment bank would be higher. And the same thing would have applied to Lehman Brothers and all those groups in terms of capital because Lehman Brothers, under the Basel system, you know, lending to an investment bank only carried a 20% capital weight, even under Basel I. Uh, so everybody was cross-subsidising uh, the cost of funds, the cost of capital to, uh, to Lehman Brothers. What you have to influence if you're going to stop excess risk-taking, uh, uh, you know, for a given leverage and, and equity and all the rest of it, is you have to have the, the risk payers, uh, the risk-taking people, paying the true cost of taking those risks. And if, you're a, if you have a non-operating holding company structure where you say, well, actually, the investment bank of Citigroup only has $10 billion capital. It does not have access to the $60 billion or $80 billion capital that Citigroup has. Just $10 billion has been invested in this entity. Then when you go out there and you say, oh, we want to do all these counterparty trades with you, uh, the counterparty people look at it and they say, but hang on. You've only got 10 billion access to 10 billion capital. So for you, uh, the spreads and the uh, the collateralising uh, through uh, uh, through uh, uh, margin requirements is going to look like this, and it's very expensive. And so Citigroup's investment bank will really struggle to get to be one of these big overlevered, uh, slothful funds that get all this cheap capital. So uh, I think it's getting the cost of capital up that uh, that makes people uh, um, you know take less risk uh, and address the risk question. And Basel does the opposite of that. Uh, you know, it, it encourages people to uh, minimise capital, whereas you need to be charging them real capital and, and making sure people can see really clearly this counterparty doesn't have any capital. It's got, it, it's got $5 billion capital. That's all it's got. If this trade fails, that's all there is backing you. Uh, then that means people see the risk and they, and they charge high for it. And, of course, that hurts the, uh, the returns of the investment bank, which is exactly what you want. Uh, and so I think that's the important part of my answer to your question. Um. Uh, Brian Beery, I'm a reporter for Europolitics. I was just very interested with the figure of $45 billion that uh, our euro, was it, that EU banks received from um, the US Federal Reserve. Just wondering, do you just explain a bit more in detail how that managed to happen? Because, of course, the European governments were giving the banks lots of money too. Um, and also, on the related question, the toxic assets, it, was your uh, argument that basically this has basically been swept under the carpet and that ultimately they will have to deal with the whole toxic assets issue to avoid another um, you know, explosion or meltdown? Yeah, well, the, uh, the, you, know, the, 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 you can just get those numbers directly from the AIG's um, um, report, so um, annual report, so uh, the, the numbers are really clear. Um, the, you, had to, you had to make a choice whether to let AIG go or not let it go. If you didn't settle all of the counterparty positions of AIG, uh, then uh, you, you know, the alternative was 
uh, they would be forced into bankruptcy by their uh, by any of the uh, European uh, any of the European uh, um, counterparties to AOG. So you had to either let it go. Upon which, I can tell you, if you thought Lehman Brothers uh, one year ago uh, caused a uh, <laughs> <laughs> a big problem in the financial markets. I mean, that would have seen like a Boy Scouts picnic in comparison to if AIG had have failed. I mean, that would have collapsed the whole banking system. Goldman Sachs wouldn't be putting aside billions of dollars for their bonus and saying we're the smartest guys in the room. They wouldn't even be in existence if they hadn't got that check. So you know, these are the kind of uh, these are the kind of things that uh, are really important. You had to either choose to let it go, or you had to had to settle all the positions. Otherwise, you don't have any choice because. European Bank would then, you know, basically sue uh, um, uh, AIG for the money, which would have driven them uh, bankrupt anyway. So uh, you either pay out or not pay out. That was your only choice. And of course, European banks are. Uh, uh, it, it is a bit. Uh, it is a bit rich for the American taxpayer, however, to think that uh, some deal couldn't have been worked out where um, uh, maybe the Europeans themselves could have uh, got involved in uh, in the saving of this uh, this thing. But it was seen as a U.S. problem. Um, what was the other half of the question? The, 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 to oh, the toxic assets, um, the, uh, as I said in my presentation, the toxic assets um, can be dealt with through the forbearance route, but it's like a juggler juggling balls. You know, you've got to keep all the balls in the air because, you know, can you solve the problem? I mean, you know, since we started this talk uh, and, uh, and by the time you walk out the door, uh, some more time will have passed. And in that hour, um, you know, banks in Europe and banks in the US would have made some more money. Uh, and every moment they don't have to be declared bankrupt and they can keep putting uh, retained earnings into their, uh, into their capital pool, uh, the problem is being solved. So it's a question of how many years of that do you have to do to make up for all the losses and capital that you have kind of sitting there, uh, some of it sort of not transparent uh, or not. So that, that is a legitimate way to do it. And if you can keep the equity markets up, then you can actually add to that process and shorten the time by issuing new shares which is quite painful if you're an existing shareholder. Uh, getting a rights issue, no one likes that. You know, we do these splits and uh, suddenly your share is only worth half what it was uh, the day before. But, uh, but that's, the way the, uh, uh, that's the way this process will work and it's, um, um, it's the way that can work. Um, but the only thing would happen uh, that would derail it would be if there was some new major event, something we don't currently know about, where some major bank, you know, had a problem and... Uh, you know, you know, we had another Lehman's type of event, then of course everything would go into reverse again and, uh, and the problems would be put set back a bit. So it can work. Uh, I'm not picking the... <laughs> the people up the front here are trying as well to, to get... You. Oh, okay. Uh, Bob Lerman, American University and Urban Institute. Uh, you didn't say a whole lot about housing and uh, <coughs> the uh, sharp drop in U.S. housing prices uh, which seems to be bottoming out, and um, I wondered why, <laughs> and uh, maybe uh, what your feeling would be about some moderate, if if there were moderate uh, growth or uh, at least stability in housing, uh, how would that affect uh, these outcomes? Yeah, no, that's uh, a good question. The um, house prices are, you know, falling and. Um, People not being able to pay their loans is a, um, you know, th these are um, have two effects on the uh, on the issues that I was talking about. Uh, one is that it leads to non-performing loans on the bank's balance sheet, uh, but where the um, but where the bank uh, the bank uh, mortgages have been um, uh, securitized and put into these structured products like in the Cayman Islands and things like that as actually underlying assets. Uh, they sit there and they're making losses, so they become uh, a part of the toxic asset problem. So um, obviously, um, you know, when you calculate the size of those losses, which we were doing in one of those tables, uh, um, that is, is actually literally done um, with a, some house price numbers uh, put into the models that we use. Uh, and, um, and obviously, the higher the house price, uh, the more you can write back uh, in terms of those, uh, those losses that they have to be dealt with. So if house prices were starting to rise, then some of these conduits that are sitting there in these off-balance sheet entities that the banks are so far not really making transparent in their earnings reports and so on, uh, that would mean that the size of the future losses from those things would be less. And so it would be very helpful to have house prices rise. But, um, and also the, uh, this, um, you know, it's kind of, it's like, it's like a slingshot as well because 
as I said at one point in my talk, you know, the, one of the most staggering things, you think that, you know, somehow or other the, uh, the, the, the powers that be could, uh, could get this right. But when, what a derivative is, is a claim at some point on an underlying security. But when you look at this and you see that the claims of the derivatives on the underlying assets are bigger than the underlying assets, uh, you know, you kind of scratch your head and think, how can that be allowed to happen? You know, that, uh, so uh, there's quite a levered effect of uh, this, that um, these, you know, these CSOs, that collateralised synthetic obligations, like a CDO, collateralised debt obligation, would have your mortgage sitting in it in the conduit in the Cayman Islands, but there are some which are, um, are, are like a derivative contract on that underlying sitting there as just a synthetic bond, you know, like a doesn't even have the asset, but it tracks the asset through a derivative. Uh, and so, um, you know, if you could get the house prices improving, then the this would feed back through into all of these other products and uh, and would help them. So, yeah, stabilising house prices and so on is, it is remiss of me not to have spoken of it, but it is a very important part of it and goes into our calculations of these losses. Um, Bert Ely, a banking consultant here in town. Um, you seem to uh, uh, speak highly of the uh, leverage ratio. Uh, the United States has had uh, the leverage ratio requirement since uh, 1991, as you observed, and we're the epicenter of the crisis. And I'm just wondering if you see any linkage there. Um, and uh, to what extent does the leverage ratio actually increase the incentive for financial engineers to arbitrage uh, bank capital uh, requirements, and in that regard, uh, how soon will Australia be Im uh, imposing a leverage r ratio requirement on its banks? I think uh, um, the, the history of this, uh, and, and given that it's your area of expertise, I, I know you will know this, but the, the history of this is that the Basel process has been going on since the uh, end of the 70s uh, for Basel I and uh, and then subsequently by uh, 2004, Basel II. Uh, and Basel II is where the, uh, Basel, the system, is where this main capital arbitrage uh, happens because, you know, what you, what you have is that there are two ways for the equity culture to work, for a given leverage ratio to take the risk up anyway or uh, for a given level of risk to increase the leverage of the company. So you can lever up a low risk position and that's one way to make a lot of profits and push your share price up. Or for a given leverage ratio, you can just take up the risk and, you know, for example, you introduce prop trading into your bank uh, and you've got a good prop trader, uh, the risk's gone up. Uh, you haven't changed your leverage ratio necessarily, but you take up the risk in the bank's portfolio. So you can either go leverage route or risk route. Uh, and, and the leverage, so what that tells you though is that leverage ratio isn't enough uh, because even with a leverage ratio, you can still take the risk up, uh, and, and certainly for the economy and in systemic ways. And I can give you plenty of examples of how that would happen even today with all the reforms coming into place. Nothing has been solved by just doing that. But what people think is is that uh, the leverage ratio is coming on board because, well, nobody wants to really admit it. I mean, the Basel system is, uh, and I'll say it, a fiasco. You know, it is a fiasco. Uh, you know, it here. You know. Could you think of something in economics? Can someone put their hand up and tell me something in economics that, had the, that is equal to this? That you would work for 15 years on a process to come up with a risk management system that just as the biggest financial crisis in 100 years was about to hit, which would need you to require much more capital than you ever imagined it would, you'd ever need, that the regulators would come up with a system which would cut the capital that you needed by a significant amount of money, that exactly at the time of 2008, that when you were going to need much more capital, they were proposing to cut the capital you should hold. Now, you couldn't get, in economics, a history, you couldn't get a more Led Zeppelin than that one. I mean, you know, you know that would have to be the, the, the most mindless kind of exercise you could ever imagine, to come up with the requirement of give all the capital back to banks so they can pay it out in special dividends and give it back, do share buybacks and so on and so forth just when they would need that capital. You know, that's got to be one of the biggest failures of all time. So to me, um, that, and, and, and how does it work? Because every time you can do, uh, I showed you the example of the Citigroup and the mortgages, you know, that every time, as soon as they knew that they were going to cut from a 50% weight to a 20% weight under their own risk modelling, then mortgages became much more attractive. Uh, and you can have... Um, you know, um, I'm not going to read this quote, but I, I you know, the, the smoking gun idea, it's not just a US thing. Uh, 
I was trying to save time in the talk, but I just love some of these quotes because, um, apologies for this. It's coming. There's the hyper. I love this one the best. This one's the best because it's not a US example, it's not even a continental European example, it's the famous Northern Rock example. And people, you know, like people in regulatory groups that I talk at, they can't believe that, uh, that this was true. That, um, so I always say, let's find the smoking gun then. Let's just find out where CEOs tell you what they were doing. Uh, and here you have a really good example. So this is the parliamentary inquiry into the failure of Northern Rock. And Mr Fallon, uh, the parliamentarian, is asking Mr Applegarth, who was the CEO of Northern Rock, the following question. Mr Applegarth, why was it decided, a month after the first profit warning, as late as the end of July, to increase the dividend at the expense of the balance sheet? Mr Applegarth, because we had just completed our Basel II two and a half year process. Now, just that part's very important. He's saying that in the middle of 2007, for two and a half years, we've been getting our portfolio anticipating Basel II. We were going to be the first Basel II bank. Our Basel II, two and a half year process, and under that, and in consultation with the FSA, the Financial Stability Authority, it meant that we had surplus capital, and therefore that could be repatriated to shareholders through increasing the dividend. This is what Basel delivered. Every bank was focused on it. Capital arbitrage. So the idea of the leverage ratio is to say, well, one way to fix that is to say, well, if people are going to keep moving to the, you know, keep the race to the bottom going to increase their leverage by taking the lowest weighted assets, that if you just impose a leverage ratio, that just stops them dead there. But it doesn't stop them going up the risk curve. So that's why all these other things are important as well. So please join me in thanking Dr. Adrian Blundell.